When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, behind the glass, tap dancing on a landmine, he is the captain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I am your captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very proud to be featuring Dark Subject Matter by the brilliant folks down at Monday Night Brewing. This is an American Imperial Stout featuring two-row Munich and chocolate malts. This beer is dark, silky smooth, roasty, and toasty, and it's delicious. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And you know who else is getting four and a half bottle caps out of five? Our almost perfect garage friends. First up, a raise of the glass to Kim in Irwin, Pennsylvania. And a big cheers, mates, to Sean in Dublin, Ireland. Next, we have Marquita, just outside of Normal, Illinois. <laughs> I live in not normal Ohio. And a big we like your jib to Heather in Milton, Ontario. Here's a big cheers to Julie in Sandy, Oregon. And last but not least, we have Lauren in sunny San Diego. So thanks to everybody for all of your help with today's show by filling up our beer fridge. If you want to help us with next week's show, go to TrueCrimeGarage.com. And I also want to thank the people that were kind enough to go to iTunes and leave a five-star review for our great little show. If you'd like to listen to our bonus weekly show, it's called Off the Record on Stitcher Premium. It's $5 a month, and you get to listen to more of our nasally drones. Plus, you can check out our old episodes on the Stitcher app for free. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Indiana, May 7th, 1993. A woman notifies the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department that her husband is missing. The normal conversation and questions follow. First, law enforcement reminds her that an adult may not necessarily be missing in the sense that they are allowed to be unaccounted for. And just because he is not where he said he would be, he may in fact be where he wants to be. Typically, in this situation, the person requesting to file the missing persons report 
will be asked to wait 48 or even 72 hours from the time the adult was last seen or heard from before filing the report. Then the woman said she has not seen her husband in quite some time. When was the last time you saw your husband? She is asked. And her reply, Thanksgiving, 1992, almost six months ago. On May 7, 1993, Paul Raymond Herod was reported missing to the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department, and he has not been seen since. Now, and for good reason, many are calling Paul the Invisible Man. On this very day, 26 years ago, a man was reported missing. That man is Paul Raymond Herod. Now, we know very little about Paul, but we do know he is reported missing by his wife. According to Paul's wife, Marla, the two met while working together at an assisted living facility for children. They met in 1990. They knew each other only for a short period of time before they started dating and eventually Marla decided to move in with Paul. We unfortunately do not have an exact date for when they moved in together, but going off of Marla's statements, this would have been in either 1990 or 1991. On June 6th, 1992, Paul and Marla got married at a very, very small ceremony at Marla's grandmother's house. The details about Paul's life are very difficult to present. For one thing, Paul didn't have any close friends, or really any friends at all. Present at Paul and Marla's small wedding were only Marla's immediate family. None of Paul's family, if in fact he had any, were in attendance. Paul's best man was a man that Paul worked with, a man that was asked by the pastor presiding over the ceremony to attend and stand in as Paul's best man. We should point out that Marla had a young son, who lived with Marla and Paul at a rental house. And we should also point out that Paul purchased a 1992 white Geo Metro. His personality, well, he's described as a man that's very difficult to get along with. I know the type. But a very hardworking man. In fact, he held three jobs during the time that Marla and Paul were together. One at St. Vincent's Hospital as a janitor and at an assisted living facility and delivering the newspapers for the Indianapolis Star. It's my impression, Captain, that Paul often worked multiple jobs all at one time. Yeah, or he wanted you to think that he was working other jobs and was very busy all the time. Now, this all seems pretty normal, but here is where things get weird. So Thanksgiving 1992, the same year that they got married, Paul and Marla attend a Thanksgiving Day get-together at one of Marla's family members' homes. Later that night, Paul drove home by himself. Marla has stated that that night Paul left their home and went to the nearest payphone. And we don't know if he placed a call or if he was receiving a call. But Marla says she has no idea who Paul was talking to. The other details of that night are sketchy. But Marla says the next day in her mailbox, she found a $100 bill with a note. The note was from Paul. We don't know exactly what the note said, but according to Marla, in the note, Paul simply stated that he, quote, needed to get away for a while. On Friday, November 27, 1992, Paul Raymond Herod left his home near Sheridan, Indiana, in his 1992 white Geo Metro two-door hatchback, leaving no indication of where he was going or when he might return, and he has not been seen or heard from since. Yeah, what's that called? A Dear John note? Right. The tricky thing here with this story, though, Captain, is we only have Marla's words to go on. We don't have anybody else to corroborate this information, right? Right. Because Marla does not bother to report Paul missing until May 7th, 1993. So let's see how well I remember math. That's like, that's 161 days later. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to wait to report somebody missing. Well, that $100 must have held her over for a long time. (laughs) 
Well, she says simply that she didn't report him missing for so long because at first she thought he would return. Right. So she finally reports him missing. This is because of the white 1992 Geo Metro hatchback. Yeah. This vehicle plays a big role in this whole story because what happens is Paul took out a loan for that car. Well, after he disappears, no one is making the payments on that loan. So the loan officer starts calling their house because they want to collect on the payments. Right. Marla is telling them it's Paul's car. It's Paul's loan. And he took off and he took the car with him. So she doesn't want to pay for this car. The bank says, we don't care where Paul is or where the car is. We want our money. And you're his wife. So if we can't get it from him, we're going to get it from you. Yeah. So that prompts her to file the missing persons report, reporting Paul and the vehicle as missing. A little suspicious. Right. To take so long. Right. And now she's off the hook for the loan or the loan payments. I actually believe that it was at the um, suggestion of the loan officer who was calling to collect. Right. That said, look, you need to make this official or we don't believe you. We're going to keep trying to get these payments. Well, it's one thing for a person to go missing, but a car did they find the car? They did, but it's going to take some time. So as soon as she files this report, we have the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. They pick up this case. Yeah. So this case, it's it's looked at, but it goes cold and fast. The difficult thing about this case for investigators immediately is with Paul having no family that anyone knows of and no friends. And his wife is out to lunch, to put it politely. The sheriff's department really are the only ones looking for him. So they simply have no leads or nobody to gather information from. Mm-hmm. But they also consider that they are fr- they are probably looking at two very simple scenarios, right? So one, either Paul took off on his own and he is long gone. This is if you believe Marla's statements. Right. Or two, Marla knows more than she has reported and may even be responsible for Paul's disappearance. Dun, dun, dun. There is very little, if any, movement on this case for quite a while until one day the case file is handed to Detective Greg Lockhart. Greg takes a look at this case. The first thing he realizes, this is only one of two outstanding missing persons cases in his county. So we have... Paul Raymond Herod missing. And the other case, they have never found the person, but they have someone in custody who has confessed to the murder of that person and even attempted to lead authorities to the body, but the body has never been located. So technically this is the only outstanding missing persons case in Hamilton County, but this may be one of the most complicated missing persons cases because what the Hamilton County Sheriff's department unravels is their missing man is not who he says he is. The missing man is not Paul Raymond Herod. See, in this investigation, the police really all what they had was a little bit of information to work from. Okay, so they had this man's parents' names and date of birth. This is really all they have to work with. This is information that the Paul Raymond Herod left on paperwork while he was you know, known to be in existence, let's say. Right. Okay. So they discover that, in fact, a Paul Raymond Herod with the same parents' names and date of birth was killed by a car in 1947 when he was five years old and the death occurred in Ohio, not Indiana. Right. So then they learned Herod's social security number was not issued until 1987. And this was the social that our missing man was using. Okay, just so this doesn't get confusing, the real Paul Herod died as a result of a car accident at the young age of five. This boy's nickname was Skippy. So we will call him Skippy, not to confuse things. So Skippy dies, and then many years later, someone gains access to Skippy's personal information and gets issued a social security number. Now, Detective Lockhart is very determined to solve this thing. He recognized that this is a very unique case and decided to apply outside-of-the-box investigative techniques to maybe finally get some answers. Detective Lockhart took to web sleuths, providing information and requesting information. 
He actually actively answers questions and looks for leads from the public using things like web sleuths. To further help crowdsource this investigation, he reached out to us at True Crime Garage. Immediately, I was fascinated by this case. For one, who really was this guy before he stole the identity of Skippy, the real Paul Herod? Right. And then where did he go after he disappeared? What was he running from to change his identity? And what caused him to continue to run after he got married to Marla? All right. So we have this missing man we're going to call Paul. Right. He marries this lady that he works with. He works supposedly three jobs. Well, we, we do know that he did work those three jobs. There There's paperwork um, that exists to this day mm-hmm. to to suggest that he did, in fact, was employed and worked all these jobs at the same time. This is how the sheriff's department came across his, the you know, supposed Paul Herod's parents' names mm-hmm. and date of birth. That was really all they had to work with when they started their missing persons investigation. Knowing the missing persons uh, parents' names and date of birth, this leads them to discover that the identity was stolen. That right. the real Paul Herod, nicknamed Skippy, was killed in an accident in 1947. And then somebody, this invisible man, Mm -hmm. uses it, it gets the social security number issued to him in 1987 using Skippy's personal information. Right. And he has little to no friends, which would make sense because he's working all the time, but he's also a grumpy SOB. Right. (laughs) But it's still so fishy that the last time you saw him also was a major holiday. Yeah. being Thanksgiving, and you haven't seen him in 160-some days, and now you're calling because, well, you have to pay for this car. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is very fishy to me. So let's go through this thing real quick before we get into some some information that was uncovered by Detective Lockhart. So the general scenario is this. This man, whoever he is, walks into town one day using the identity of a dead boy. Okay, Paul Raymond Herod. He falls in love with this woman. This woman, Marla, was actually married at the time when the two met. And she leaves her husband to go start a relationship with him. With the grumpy guy. Yeah, they get married. (laughs) Could you imagine what her husband was like? Well, and then once he disappears, here's the tricky thing in this whole whole story. Mm Mm-hmm. What is this guy running from to the point that he steals an identity, starts a whole new life under this identity, and then if we are to believe Marla's words, one day he gets a phone call or makes a phone call and leaves. He Mm -hmm. just up and leaves town. So you have to wonder, is this guy running for his life, or is he running from the law, or is he running from both, Well, and and he gets tipped off some information, and he decides he's got to run again. Well, it seems like all these jobs he has, these three jobs are kind of entry-level jobs anyways. But then it makes you wonder, was he possibly a felon that couldn't get certain jobs? That's why he steals the identity, so there he, therefore he can get jobs. But then what's this call? Or we have a motive for the ex-husband going, hey, he stole my wife. I'm going to steal your life. Right, Mm -hmm. right, and that was the suspicion of the sheriff's department right away. They're like, okay, Marla does not report him missing for 161 days. Mm -hmm. So either she knows more or could be involved. Maybe her ex-husband killed Paul. Because at some point, Marla and her ex-husband, they rekindle their relationship. Mm. That's fishy. it's It's a very strange situation, but we do have some information that Detective Lockhart uncovers. So Lockhart found that someone using Paul Herod's name opened up a bank account in the very small town of Hoven, South Dakota. This, so this account was opened after Paul went missing from Sheridan, Indiana in late 1992. Mm -hmm. So at the end of 1992, there was approximately $52 in this account. Lockhart found a year end statement This is the kind of breadcrumb trail that he is determined to find. So the good detective told us the name of the bank, but I can't 
find it in my notes, but this may be the only bank in Hoven, South Dakota at the time, because this is an extremely small town. Mm -hmm. In 2010, the census says less than 500 people lived there in 2010. Right. There is evidence to suggest that there was no activity regarding this bank account the following year in 1993. So either that man who was going by the name of Paul did in fact set up that account or somebody set it up right. to make it look like Paul was still around. Then Detective Lockhart uncovered more. He found some small trace of the Geo Metro. So he found that it was sold in Denver, Colorado in 1994. Today, the dealership has no record of where the car came from, but they told Lockhart this. This car would not have been imported from any other state, meaning right. it was either sold or abandoned or seized somehow inside the state of Colorado. And this dealership obtained this vehicle, but it definitely came from Colorado, and they say likely Denver, the same city as the dealership. But Colorado is pretty... Good distance from Indiana. Right. So if you're following the paper trail here, we have Paul Herod who leaves Sheridan, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then it's about a 14 hour drive to that Hoven, South Dakota, where the bank account is opened up. Remember, he left the day after Thanksgiving. And we believe that there's no activity on that bank account in 1993. So very likely this Paul Herod sets up this bank account at the end of 92, using it maybe only for that the month of December or for a few days or weeks or whatever. It's a little curious why somebody would even bother to open up the account and use it for such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm guessing that he has a check from a job that he hasn't cashed yet. You can make a 14-hour trip in one day. So mm -hmm. you drive there. You set up the account, you stay a night or two because they tell you, hey, you got to deposit these checks and then they're going to be made available in a couple days. Mm -hmm. So then once they're made available, then you take that money and you leave. Yeah. So this is 14 hours away to that Hoven, South Dakota. That's interesting that you say that, Captain, because that points out, points towards evidence of another thing, that phone call, right? So if Marla's statements about this phone call are true, that either he made a phone call or received one, that he was not intending to hear whatever he was told during the course of that phone call, that maybe he was, he, his intentions were not to leave that night. Mm -hmm. And something he learned something during the course of that phone call that prompts him to leave. And then, as you said, since nobody's looking for him, because Marla, the only person that knows that he's missing, says that, oh, I thought he would come back because that's what his note said. Yeah. He, he then returns to collect on money that he needs to keep moving. That's interesting. Well, but also he doesn't drain the account. So it's almost like he, wherever he was heading, he thought, well, I'm going to come back this way and maybe drain the account. So it's almost evidence. Well, that, it's only $52. Yeah, but I mean... I, mean, I don't know what activity was done on the account, so I don't know how much he, you know, like I said, he could have two or three checks that he deposited and he waited for, took the money, but why not take all the money? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the interesting thing, too, is there, do we have another scenario that happens in Hoven, South Dakota, where he decides he has to run again, you know, get some more information and has to up and leave again, leaving but, the $52 in the account? I also think you have this scenario where he gets a phone call and there's something from his past that he has to take care of, but that maybe he always planned on returning. Here's some money. I'm going to come back, goes wherever, does these bank transactions, but he's still heading towards somewhere. We obviously don't know where he's heading to and something happens. Maybe he had to take care of something bad and that didn't work out and he, and he died somewhere. Or somebody killed him and cause you know, it's the way the car dealership says is they didn't pay for the vehicle. It wasn't a trade in or it seems like, well, no, what they say is they don't know how they acquired. That's the what vehicle. I'm saying. But they give some suggestions of it might've been abandoned. It could have been repoed. 
or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Difficult situation there. Right. So the only information we have from the dealership is what their opinions are. Their opinions are, we've lost the records of how we obtained this car. Mm -hmm. We know we have it. We had the vehicle at one time because we sold it in 1994. So following the paper trail, he leaves in 92 in Indiana. Then about 14 hour drive later, there's a bank account. We, again, we should be clear. We don't know what the activity is on that bank account. The only paper trail that they're able to find is a year end statement. Right. The end of the year statement for 1992 that says there's an account with the name Paul Raymond Herod and there's $52 left in the account. Now, 1993 comes and goes and there's no end of year statement from that bank regarding that account. So we don't know exactly what happened there, but the car is sold. This is a nine hour drive from Hoven, South Dakota, all the way to Denver, Colorado. And what they, they simply say here is, Look, we, we sold the vehicle in 1994, so we must have acquired it shortly before that. It's believed that they acquired it at an auction, mm -hmm. and they sold it, and in fact, everybody that's owned the vehicle since then has spoke to Detective Lockhart, but the thing is, what, what they told the detective is, look, this was not a highly desired car. It wasn't a, a very valuable car. Speak no, for yourself. They say- Priceless. No, Nobody would pay to import this vehicle from another state. It would right. it would just cut into your, any chance you have of making any profit off of selling the vehicle. So if we are to believe that is, in fact, Paul Raymond Herod, our missing guy mm -hmm. who is transporting this vehicle out to Colorado, then we have to assume that after he left on Thanksgiving, at some point he makes his way to South Dakota and then decides he's got to leave again. And now he heads to Colorado. The problem is we don't know where he could have gone after that. Well, and we don't understand what the phone call was about. So the possibilities of the invisible man are endless. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers. So here's a big problem with this case and with this investigation. You know, we've covered plenty of missing persons cases, but... So much time is spent looking at who the person was that went missing in their life and things going on in their life. Yeah. The problem here is we don't know who this guy really is. We don't know who this person using Paul Raymond Herod's identity truly is. The other thing is we don't know where he came from. We don't know why he just pops up on the radar and steer, steals this identity to begin with. So that end is something, it's a weird investigation because you're almost torn in two directions. One, where could he have gone? 
Two, who was he before? Yeah, who the heck is this grumpy SOB? Right, and why was he running? Mm. We were asked to cover this case so that we could get as many ears on it as possible, which would turn into eyes viewing pictures of this Paul Raymond Herod. We need information. Where could he have been? And where did he go? And who was he? Yeah, he could have had a lot of family members that could see this and and give us answers. And Detective Lockhart, we were able to sit down with him, and he was going to fill us in on some of the possibilities of who Paul Raymond Herod actually was before he stole this identity. So, Detective Lockhart, you found paperwork that Paul Raymond Herod used to get jobs. And on one of these pieces of paper, he says that he attended Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. Is that correct? That's correct. That being said, that was Roosevelt Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. Recently, I have learned that there are at least five different Roosevelt High Schools in that immediate vicinity. The important thing here, Captain, is that we know that during the time that this person using the name Paul Raymond Herod, that he was known to, let's say, exist, Mm -hmm. he had to fill out paperwork for different things. You know, whether it be getting a job, getting a marriage license, the car loan. What the detective is looking for is information on that remain, you know, any of that paperwork that remains available to this date. Right. That could lead him to who this guy actually was. When he was filling out paperwork, did he slip up and actually put some truthful information about himself? Right. Or is it all bullshit? Is it all bullshit? Mm -hmm. The problem here, though, is it's difficult to find these things. So once you do find them, oh, here's a lead. He may have attended Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. That seems like a great lead. Crap. There's five schools there that are called Roosevelt School in the Yonkers area, one. And then two, we have no idea what year this guy would have attended and what name he was using at the time. Right. So a big problem here, too, that we have to keep in mind is we don't know this individual's real age. At the time that Paul Raymond Herod disappeared, he was of the age of 51. Had Paul, you know, had Skippy really lived that long of a life. Right. So here's my thought, Captain. I My first suspicion regarding this is however this guy got Skippy's information I think if he was looking to steal someone's identity and start up a new life, one thing you might want to try to do is find somebody that's roughly your same age. You know, maybe within four or five years younger or four or five years older than you, so you look the part. Yeah, right. I'm guessing people would go younger. Right. But it's one thing to put a little bullshit on a job application, but you're married to somebody. He had to sit there and have conversations with Marla. You'd think at some point he would use actual truth because that would be easier to remember. Right. I, and I agree with that. And she, Marla was able to tell me a few things about him. Uh, and her her sister, Kim, was able to tell me one thing that was interesting. Um, so you're, you're asking Marla to draw on memories from, you know, 26 years ago at this point. And some of them are, are more clear than others. Um but a few of the things that she w- she was able to tell me were that Paul spoke one time about working at Herod's Casino in Vegas. Didn't did not give me a time frame. Did not know that time frame. Uh, safe to say it's before 1991. Paul had also mentioned that he was either in the Air Force or associated with the Air Force and that he was either stationed or flew over an Air Force base in Greenland, which there is only one of. She also told me that that he has a large scar on the crown of his head that goes toward the back, straight over the top of his head and toward the back of his head, and he would never give her a reason or an explanation for why that scar is there. He would always change the subject. And of, of interesting note, You mentioned pillow talk. Marla says one night they were laying in bed and they were having a conversation about nothing in particular. And Paul stopped and looked at her and said, you know, I can disappear at any time. 
I know how to do it. And I believe that statement from Marla because when she told me this, she became infuriated. She teared up and she became mad. So it was a very real reaction for her. It was almost like she relived it because that's what happened. Well, Paul's better at pillow talk than I am. I mean, the last thing I brought up was, did you know that Bundy would make his girlfriend play dead during sex? (laughs) These are my great ideas of pillow talk. Well, this sounds like a threat. Like something's going on in this conversation where he wants to kind of threaten her. That's what I believe. Mm-hmm. Of saying to the person that you're supposed to be in love with, the person, they may be even be married at this point. And he says, you know, I can disappear whenever I feel like it because I know how to. Or possibly a power move in the relationship. You know, like, well, hey, you know, if just to let you know. I could disappear at any time, so you better treat me right or something like that. Why does Marla take so long to report Paul missing? I describe Marla as Marla is a good person. Let me start by saying that. Marla tends to, in my opinion, bury her head in the sand and wish things go away. I don't, I personally do not feel that she has ever dealt with him leaving her. I think it is still a very open, wound on her body. She, she is a victim of him emotionally, but she's had other issues in her past as well, that this was just another compounding issue. Um, but no, she's never dealt with Paul leaving. And so in that way, she's still truly a victim. I think that she still, I would argue to say that if Paul came back around, that she'd probably take him back. Yeah. And that's not healthy. I mean, Going back to an ex is like taking a shower and putting on your old dirty underwear. This doesn't make sense. Was there anything else that you found out through some paperwork that Paul filled out that might lead us to figure out who, in fact, he was before? So there's there's only one thing that I have found that I like to describe as either A, a breadcrumb, or a major mistake on Paul's part. On June 5th, 1992, he and Marla went to do their paperwork to get married. So a marriage application. And on his side of that paperwork, he gives his mother's name as Margaret Coletti, C-O-L-E-T-T-I. And he gives his father's name as Paul L. Herod. Skippy's real mother's name was Mary Condon. Herod. And his father's name was Paul Monroe Herod. Now, the reason I think it's either A, a breadcrumb, or B, a major mistake, is Paul had been Paul Raymond Herod for five years at that point. And he had, he had completed many a forms and completed them correctly with the correct parents' names. That's why I believe it's one of those two things with the mother's name in particular. The only other thing that we have found was that his car appears in Inglewood, Colorado at an auto auction in January, I believe January 24th or 27th of 1994. Now it's at an auction being sold. I do not know how it got to the auction. I don't know where the vehicle was recovered from. But I have spoken to several of those auto auction dealers. But of course, 26 years later, we do not have records. He goes missing around Thanksgiving 1992. Is there anything that could have happened that day or in that moment that spooked him, that caused him to leave, that Marla remembers any kind of interaction with her family or anything somebody may have witnessed. So that's kind of where some different theories come into play. One of my theories is that the person we love to call Paul was running from the police or better yet for his life, whatever his problem was, he wasn't going to the police. So we can only assume that he has troubles with the law. But he's also seems to be moving enough that his life is at, as a, is at stake for something. Uh, we don't know whether the scar comes into play with that on his head. There's so much that we just don't know about Paul or, or who he was before. 
I would like to think that if he did, in fact, on Thanksgiving Day, go and use the phone, he probably received some information to push him to go. I obviously don't know that, but that's that's one of my thought processes on this. Well, and it's so frustrating. Just take Marla, for example. 161 days to report your husband missing. That's it's frustrating. Well, I also think that the most frustrating portion of this case in the story and the investigation is Marla herself because she seems to put very little to no effort at all to, one, try to figure out who this guy actually was, where he went, or provide law enforcement with any information to help them in their search. And I get the personality that you've described, but it just seems a little like convenient on her end that she's not offering up anything. No, oh, I'm right there with you. And you know, I've been asked that by many people. You know, why didn't she report it for five or six months? You have to, you have to meet her to understand that. Uh, going into this case, my initial assumption was one of two things. She or someone close to her, like her ex-husband, had murdered Paul. Or B, he had actually run away. After initially speaking to her, you would expect to see something in her body language, especially the way that we approached her about it while she was at work and just out of the blue 20 years later asking her questions. And she speaks to me now the way that she did then. There is no difference. She has, she has the I don't care attitude of he left me. So I think part of the bigger problem with Marla is that she left her husband for Paul for what she perceived to be a better life. And five or six months later, he leaves her. So, you know, again, initially I I had looked at that uh, and I'm not saying it's not possible. She would have to probably be a pretty damn good liar um, and a little bit of a sociopath in order to, to not show any emotion even 20 years later. So I, I, I've kind of put that thought process out of the equation for it, um, especially once I learned that Paul had stolen Skippy's identification uh, or ID, and then the car is found in Colorado. I'm not saying it's not possible that the car couldn't get out there somehow, but uh, it seems like a little bit more of a stretch for me at this point to think that Marla was uh, – culpable in anything that for Paul's disappearance. Yeah, I would agree with that. There's, there's one thing that we didn't discuss earlier. And that was when I brought up the name on the uh, marriage application of Margaret Coletti Uh, on that same application, Paul did put that he was married and divorced that he was at least divorced in 1985. Oh, wow. So the thing with that is that, Marla said she identified the ex-wife as being Diane or Diana Ray, R-A-E, and she remembered the middle name because of the spelling. Marla believed that they were married in either Wichita, Kansas, or at least lived together in Wichita, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. Trying to find any type of those records for me, not living in the States, a little challenging. Um, so that's another lead that I'm trying to actively pursue. Well, to me, that sounds like the biggest breadcrumb, right? Mm-hmm. Like he, again, if you're telling people stories, it's hard to remember lie after lie. And if he's talking about his ex a lot, or or maybe he's not. But if he brought her up more than a couple times, at some point you have to give her a name. And so is that information complete horse shit or is he actually telling the truth? And if he is, then we at least have a name and we have a location that we could start tracking back to. And that's the thing that I think is so interesting. And that's why I also think it's so frustrating that Marla doesn't seem to be super involved in this investigation nor care to be. Well, yeah, but a part of you has to go, this asshole left her. Here's a hundred bucks and I'm leaving. No answer. I mean, this is like now people you know, go on a couple of dates and they just never return your text or never return your call. It's called ghosting. This guy was the ultimate ghoster. But I believe that when you're with somebody or that you're, you're in communication with somebody for this length of time between him and his wife, 
that there's going to have to be some truth that is in that information, in those conversations along the way. I agree. They all can't be lies. And that's where I get frustrated where we're not be, we're not able to get enough information from Marla, and now we have a situation where it's 26 years later, and she very likely can't remember any of that stuff. But the key thing here that's very interesting is she remembers the spelling of the middle name of who she was told is his ex-wife, right. Ray, R-A-E. And so that, I think, is one of those little tidbits that you're like, this could be some truth. There could be some truth to this one statement here. Yeah, it's very detailed. It's very detailed that she even remembers the spelling. But also, why pick Skippy? Right. Again, I think that goes back to you have to find somebody that's roughly your same age or an age that you look like so that you look the part. The thing that jumps off the page here, too, is that we have two jobs, we're talking about a, a man that when you are able to trace his work history as Paul Raymond Herod, they're able to trace like six or seven jobs that this guy had. But at the time that Marla knew him, he had three jobs and two of them are at, at assisted living facilities. Now we do know that at some point Skippy, when his father becomes elderly later in life, he is living at an assisted living facility. Which would roll into my other theory that that I believe that there's a possibility that Paul actually had met Skippy's dad at an old folks home or a retirement home near the Cleveland area. Uh, Skippy's dad died east of Cleveland in a retirement home in 1988. So if if Paul had met Skippy's dad, that's how he could have obtained Skippy's information to use it in 1987 prior to Skippy's father dying. Which is a little bit of a leap because we don't have any evidence of Paul being in Ohio. Yes, it is a leap. It's, it's, it's difficult, though, because if he were at some point in Ohio, it's very likely he was not using any of Paul's information at that time. That's just a theory of mine at this point. I woke up several weeks ago out of a dead sleep and said, oh my goodness, this is, this is my connection. Uh, it was just my, whether it's a you know, divine intervention or whatever, I don't know what it is. It was just a thought that woke me from my sleep because of the information that I knew Paul worked at a retirement home in Indianapolis. And what a perfect way to get information to create a new name. What else can you tell us about items that you have found in the course of your investigation? What was this man up to during the time that we know that the invisible man was Paul Raymond Herod? Right. The only thing we know uh, is that he lived in a trailer court for a little bit in Westfield, Indiana, which is just south of Sheridan. He worked at a, I believe it was called Chesty potato chips where he was a potato chip delivery guy for like uh, you know, snack machines. That company went defunct years ago. We know that he uh, worked at a liquor store in Westfield, Indiana, which is long ago, you know, went defunct and the owner's dead. But this would have been under Paul Raymond Herod. Right. So nothing, there's nothing before, you know, 19... 87 paperwork wise that we can find. The other issue is that this is 26 years later. And even when I started this case in, you know, six years ago, this is, uh, almost every business after 10 years gets rid of their records. So the records that I have found, I've been extremely lucky to find, but there's probably still more stuff out there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting, citizens involved, which, you know, there are people looking into it, uh, on, on the citizen side and time and ability. A lot to unpack here on this episode of the invisible man. So I want to point out here a couple things, captain, that I think are extremely important. Mm -hmm. One, if if we are to believe that this individual, that the invisible man was roughly the age of Paul Raymond Herod of what he would have been. Mm -hmm. 
So he would have been 51 at the time that he went missing. We're talking this case 26 years after this guy goes missing. Mm -hmm. So he would be in his 70s or roughly there thereof. Right. In his 70s. Law enforcement have no indication, nothing that would indicate to believe that this individual is in fact dead at this time. So the troubling thing here is who is this guy? What the hell was he running from? We could be talking about an extremely, an extremely dangerous individual. We've had instances throughout the course of history where we have people that come forward and, and point law enforcement to an individual. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody that murdered their entire family, right? Somebody that has killed several people and they're located 10, 15, 20 years after the fact because of things like crowdsourcing, that they get people involved, they get the public involved, they put the pictures out there, and they say, do you know anything about this man? You know, just watching that Bundy movie on Netflix this weekend makes you think, he escaped twice. And and what if he was able to get a false identity and live for years as somebody else? Mm -hmm. What kind of damage... Bundy could have done. And this could be somebody that you you may have lived in the same neighborhood with yeah. at one point. You could have worked. We do know that this individual seemed to work a lot. Mm -hmm. You could have worked with him at some point. He could be living down the street from you today. Even though we believe that he would be in his 70s, we could still be talking about a very dangerous individual. What we do know about this individual, the very simple things and facts that we can gain from all of this information is that he was running from something that he could not get law enforcement involved in. Mm -hmm. He couldn't go to law enforcement and say, Hey, I'm running because of this. So that makes me wonder, is he in fact dangerous on the flip side of that? If there is some connection to a guy that lives in Youngstown, if there's any weird connection to like the mob, it would make sense that you go somewhere, lay low and work a ton of jobs to save up money to pay somebody back. Mm -hmm. So there, there's just so many possibilities with this case. Right. Right. So what we're asking everybody to do is this is a little recommended viewing, if you will, right? So everybody, please go to truecrimegarage.com and look at the pictures of the invisible man. Because maybe you know something. If you can see him. And if you have any information, you can submit that information to Detective Lockhart at 317-776-9887 or through the Hamilton County Public Safety Communications at 317-773-1282. Also, don't forget to submit your theories and questions to our blog at truecrimegarage.com. One, it's interesting to see a detective like Greg be so active on a case that people haven't been active on and also look for alternative sources to create leads. Mm -hmm. So it was an honor to talk to him. That's right. Thank you to Detective Lockhart. Thank you to everybody out there listening. Thank you to you, Captain. Everybody, we will be back here tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.